Tina, 1948, Hempstead, Long Island, New York. That's right. Let's go back. It's not too far back when you were a no. young girl. What was life like for you in New York? Um, life was actually very good. It was the days where, you know, the, the big comment from your mother on a weekend was make sure you're home for dinner, you know, and you ride your bikes around the neighborhood and play with friends. Um, and uh, it was... Um, it, it was very interesting. The neighborhood where I first grew up in uh, changed a lot. And when there was, uh, and we walked to school, and there was a bar in the area, so my parents noticed that more and more people were hanging outside the bar in the middle of the day. So we moved to the other side of town, and which was great because it was also closer to our synagogue. And uh, so that, you know, for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we would walk to synagogue, yeah, you know, my yeah. father and I. So uh, the, it was... It was very good. It was it was good. Uh, our lives became very Jewish oriented when I was five. My mother joined the choir in our synagogue, and in order to accompany, he didn't want my mother, my father didn't want my mother to go alone. So we he would schlep us all, you know, to my sister and I to synagogue. And of course, we had pews. We didn't have seats, so people would see me falling asleep or whatever. But uh, so I became the darling of the synagogue. They knew me since I was five, and I went every Friday night. My parents were not, they were always uh, identified strongly as, or identified as Jewish, but they didn't have strong Jewish backgrounds. They grew up poor during the Depression. My father said he was bar mitzvahed in, a, in his grandfather's old age home, you know. And um, so we got involved in the synagogue, and to the point that my father became president of the synagogue, I went every Friday night and Saturday morning. Uh, the year I was bat mitzvah, I was there seven days a week between USY and Hebrew school lessons and Hebrew, you know, and, and bat mitzvah lessons and services. So it, the, the synagogue was my home away from home. What did your dad do for a living? My father was an automotive painting and repair um, person. He was a um, very good-natured, very, you know, hale and hearty, with, you know, a barter system way of life. He literally took a uh, weekend course on how to paint cars. And Mr. Sokolov, who I was, I don't know how he met Mr. Sokolov, but Mr. Sokolov, on a handshake, gave my father $100,000 in 1950 to open up his auto painting shop. And my father had the largest independent auto painting shop in Nassau County, which Nassau County at that time had the uh, largest number of cars per capita of any place in the country. So I guess it worked out fine. Now, Mr. Sokoloff, was he a banker? Um, I don't know what he was. You know, I, I, all I know is he lived on the north shore of Long Island, which was, you know, untouchable. You know, it's where the Great Gatsby took place, uh, literally. And, um, I never knew how Dad met him. He certainly wasn't a member of our congregation or whatever, but my father was honest and, you know, personable, and, and it all worked out. Now, was your dad uh, in World War II? Yes. Well, towards the end of World War II, he was a radio man in the Air Force, and he... Um, <laughs> He had a major injury only because the pilot of the plane one day decided he wanted to visit his mother in North Carolina, and there was a big ice storm, and the plane crashed. Really? So, so he was he was pretty badly injured, but he was also he was in Japan right after um, peace was declared. So he was there for a while, and he was in Ho in Hawaii. Did he ever say how the Japanese people were to them right after the war? Um, <laughs> Uh, no, and I'm laughing because the only thing I know about that is my father would make extra money by selling cigarettes to the Japanese. <laughs> so, you know, I guess he got along with them very well. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your mom. My mother um, was a very interesting woman. Neither one of my parents had high school educations, although my father went on to graduate cum laude from Adelphi University. He got his GED. Uh, my mother... Um, finished school the sophomore year in high school. She, uh, her mother died when she was five. 
Her father married an old girlfriend from Poland who he thought would help take care of my mother because my mother's two sisters were seven and ten years older than her. And they were already out of the house by the time, you know, she was seven or eight. And my mother's stepmother was, uh, became very sickly. So my mother took care of her and then she died. Then my mother took care of her father who died three months before her wedding to my father oh. Oh. and but my mother my you know my mother had an influence with on me about food um, in in one way that was very important because she was hungry during the depression so you know she had ketchup sandwiches she said you know so we weren't allowed to do that she would stand outside of bakery sometimes just inhaling the aroma and she did what we see in many cultures around the world do. She literally treated food with reverence. So every night we all had our own individual wooden salad bowls. And there would be a radish rose, a green pepper ring, and four wedges of tomato. Mm. And to this day, I feel guilty as all get out because I hate making salads. Because <laughs> I mean, and especially with my profession, yeah. but I hate making salads because you know it's just never as beautiful, you know. Right. But she she presented food lovely, you now, know. I mean, when you were young, did you understand the significance of what she was doing and probably why she was doing it? I think so. I think so because I know that uh, one of the things is our refrigerator was always full. Yeah. It was always full. Uh, she didn't go, um, you know, neurotic about not eating leftovers, you know, or, or we right. had to eat leftovers. She, that, that was never a presence in our house. Mm -hmm. But the quality and the quantity of food. And, and she was a basic cook. Right. Um, my, it was my neighbor that taught me how to bake. But she was a basic cook, and um, her satyrs were wonderful. Now, your grandparents, what, what did they do for a living? Uh, my mother's parents I never knew because they they right. you know died before she was even married. My grandmother didn't work. My grandfather worked for my father. He would sit in the uh, in the shop and he would use the do the little ledger and you know he would. I think he had a push card at one time. He you know he didn't do a lot of things. I mean my father before he was he used to be a nursery man. Yeah. You know, so yeah. he did odd jobs before he got into the automotive. My grandfather would sit at a little desk by the door to his little balcony in their apartment, and he would paint, and he would he would copy masters. Mm -hmm. And the significance of that is when I was 11 years old, he took me to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I wrote down all the Hebrew that was on every Chagall window that was on display there. And he painted the Chagall windows individually from the Life magazine pictures. Right, right. And I have them framed in my house yeah. as to this day. And he would, he would read a lot. So my father would say that growing up he would discuss Nietzsche with my grandfather. Yeah. And these are all people that didn't have major educations, you know. Where'd you go to high school? I went to Hempstead High School. Hempstead High School was a very racially mixed high school, right smack in the middle of Nassau County. Um, and it what used to be the hub of Nassau County. People would come into shop. It, people even it was really the active center until Roseville Field was built, which was the first um, um, shopping mall in the country. Right changed everything. It was the first shopping mall in the country? Mm -hmm. The first indoor shopping mall in the country. As a result, as I got older, um, I would say probably when I started to go to college, the main street of my town in the smack in the middle of Long Island was boarded up, except for a pawn shop and a bank. Now what was it in high school that uh, you used to do that your parents never knew? Okay. Junior year in high school, my girlfriend and I went bowling, and I bought a pack of Kents, and I smoked three quarters of the pack with ever inha not inhaling. And my parents were all smokers, and my sister was a smoker, and I hated it, you know. And I used to bite my nails, and I was 
I was not cheap. I, I, you know, at any given time, you knew you could find money in my jewelry box. I w always saved up my money. And I said, this is stupid. I'm not spending 35 cents for a pack of cigarettes. So I never smoked again, and that was it. There you go. Now, in high school, you met your future husband. <laughs> yes, I did. At a USY convention in Laurelton because his mother broke her hip. And she was planning a surprise party for him. And then he found that, and he says, well, there's this keenness. I don't really know what it is, but can I go? And she says, sure. And I was, a, as he would put it, a big mach in USY for Nassau County. So I met him. And what happened for after that meet? Well, um, we talked on the phone a lot. I had a driver's license and a car because my father would fix up wrecked cars, you know, and Richard didn't have his driver's license yet. And he didn't feel it was comfortable going out with me driving. He didn't want to do that, you know. So um, when he finally got his driver's license, we went out, but he, he won me over when he said to me about two months after we had met, he says, you know, I almost stopped calling you. He said, because I felt uncomfortable that we were talking so much and I enjoyed it, but I couldn't take you out. And I realized this was quite a young man and he was very mature and I loved him. And that was it. I never dated anybody else. Wow. Neither did he. We went to school 50 miles apart. So, yeah. college. Now, after high school, where, where did you go on to college? I went to Syracuse. I went to Syracuse University. Okay. And he went to Hobart and William Smith, which was in Geneva, New York, and I was in Syracuse. So it was about 50 miles down the road. Now, were you, when you were in college, did you already know what you wanted to get into? I already knew what I wanted to get into when I was 12 years old. Okay. Um, when I was, um, first of all, I had, when we moved to the other side of town, there was a neighbor who, Mrs. Wood, who was um, 41 years old when she became a widow. She was of German background and she had three boys and she was a phenomenal baker. And she took me under her wing as her surrogate daughter and I would walk across the street, you know, it was a small little street, but I walked across the street and I would sit in her little um, garden room with a typewriter typing out recipes on index cards. I still have all of those oh, recipes. Wow, wow. And so I really loved baking and it was my creative outlet. Nobody in my family baked, so it was something that I could do differently. And then when I was 12 years old, I had a Jewish home economics teacher who was, you know, I thought she was old. She probably was 28, but she had two <laughs> young kids, you know, or 32, but she was cool. And I decided then, that what I wanted to do when I grew up was teach home economics. It's to the point that for my bat mitzvah, when the entire congregation was invited and 500 people showed up, mm -hmm. my parents gave me a choice of a big party or a sewing machine. I still have that sewing machine. Oh. <laughs> and it wasn't that I was nerdy practical. I just loved to sew. I mean, I sewed my entire trousseau. When you were a young woman in your 20s, it was a very turbulent time in the country. Mm -hmm. the Vietnam War was raging. There's a lot of demonstrations across the country. You know, we, the Kennedy assassinations, you know, John and then his brother uh, Robert. Mm -hmm. How did all this affect you? Significantly. Um, I just, like, I think anybody who was alive in over the age of 12 probably remembers when Kennedy was shot. I remember where I was sitting in chemistry class in high school. I remember being glued to the TV the entire weekend. Um, I was brought up to believe that people should be judged by who they are, not by the color of their skin or their religious beliefs or what country they come from. So I was very upset you know, at uh, the, all the racial tension in the 60s, especially since I lived in a community that was at 50% African American. You know, growing up, I didn't say I'm inviting this Italian friend and this black friend and this, you know, Jewish friend to a party. I said, I'm inviting Jennifer and Jessica, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was a, kind of a pacifist, you know. My husband was more politically um, astute, not involved in SDT or anything like that, but he did march on Washington after Kent State. You know, um, I had already graduated early because I wanted to get a job and do what I want, love doing. Um, but I am, I am very active uh, emotionally and um, 
wherever I can physically in, in injustices okay. around the world. Now, now talk to me about writing the cookbooks. Okay. When did that start? It started, uh, well, you have to really go back about 14 years ago. I was, my family was invited to Davin Torah on Yom Kippur at Temple Emmanuel. And um, I wore my father's tali. And it was like an epiphany. I think, well, I never, I never leave Temple on, on Yom Kippur. I stay there. I often go to the library and read cookbooks because I love history and, you know. And I was reading Reform Judaism magazine and there was an article, there was an editorial by the then president of the URJ who talked about the perfunctory kiss and how, you know, things can stay with you, you know, and help keep the foundation, but you have to, you know, it was basically an argument for you can't show up at synagogue once a year, but you need to have a good foundation. And that night, or the next day, I wrote a letter to them saying, you are missing the boat if you do not have a food column in this magazine because the olfactory senses are the closest connection to memory. And um, they wrote me back and they said, well, we really don't have um, room for a column, but we will entertain you writing an article. Well, that was 10 years and 40 articles later. I, I became the food columnist for Reform Judaism magazine. And then the, I put in a proposal for a cookbook. And um, they, it took a while because it's expensive to do a cookbook, especially if you want to do it right with photographs and everything. And it got accepted. So um, I, my first book, uh, I researched. It was it's an international cookbook essentially. But my you know when I give talks now, very often the title of my talk is Beyond Brisket and Bagels. I wanted Jews to understand, and I wanted people to understand that the foods that we associate with Jewish cooking are not necessarily representative of the whole world, Jewish world. But more importantly, as I did research, and for the magazine, I had to research everything. I mean, I couldn't say the Sabbath queen without researching who was the first person to coin that phrase. So I found myself reading Talmud. I found myself reading the Jewish encyclopedia. I was, you know, searching the internet for all good Jewish sites. I never, as my daughter reprimanded I mean, she's never used Wikipedia. I never used Wikipedia, you know. And um, I really saw what happened after the expulsion of the Jews in 1492 from Spain and how it really affected world cuisine. And I, and I, I, I liken it to what happened when I came down to Dallas in 1974. When I came down here the first time, I remember Rosh Hashanah, I was looking for advertisements saying, you know, place your tegelach and your challah orders now for the high holidays. And most people didn't know what I was talking about with tegelach. And, um, and, I, re and I actually then went on to teach tegelach here. And um, when I was here for a number of years, I was invited to teach in Manhattan at the JCC. And what did they ask me to teach? Fajitas. And the idea was, exactly, and the idea was that you take that which you know. You know, before 9-11, I had to go to visit my son at USC and the fraternity with about 30 pounds of barbecue in the overhead compartment because that's what you brought from Texas. So I saw that happening when the Jews were expelled, and I researched that history more, and I saw what was happening, and I wanted to teach that. I wanted people to understand, you know. So I love my first book, and that's what I just, that's why I'm hoarse now. That's what I taught this weekend in Florida, you know, is the history and the connections and the stories behind the food. Right, right. So. Right. How, how many books have you written? Now? I have now written two. Wow. The second one came out this fall. It's um, the first one was on traded Judaism, a culinary exploration of the Jewish diaspora. The second one is on traded Judaism for families, Jewish cooking and kitchen conversations with children. Because I want the recipes, which are adult recipes, and are from all parts of the world, although I have a section on just for fun, which is meat, all meatballs from around the world and things like that. I wanted 
to give an opportunity for parents and grandparents to share their stories with their children. And grandchildren. Now, 74, so what brought you down here? <laughs> My husband was in medical school at Mount Sinai, and a doctor who was his advisor there convinced him to get a PhD in the middle of medical school. And traditionally, you do your research after the first two years of basic training, and the doctor got a job offer down in Southwestern. So it's who you do your research with rather than what you do it in. Uh, so we came down here with the understanding that if Richard wanted to, a place would be made in the third year medical school class at Southwestern. So he finished up his MD from Southwestern and his PhD is from Mount Sinai. But, but then you left again. Then we left for internship and residency. We were in Philadelphia, and then he did um, a fellowship at the Rockefeller Institute. And then he was offered two jobs. One was very prestigious with nothing to offer in terms of equipment or lab space or anything and the other was at Southwestern. So we came down here in 82, and we have been here ever since. Was it a culture shock for you at first? The first time it was. 1974, the only reason to have sour cream in a supermarket was to put it on top of nachos. They had no concept of maybe putting it in borscht or anything. You know, I mean, it really was not ethnic. Right. In, and when we were leaving in 77, they were voting to make Addison wet. And I could not understand that. But to me, I said, you know, if the, pi if the people who own the, f the planes at the Addison Airport want to serve alcohol, let them serve alcohol. What's the big deal? Because in 1977, the only thing on Beltline was the, um, the Addison Schoolhouse and the Payless Cashways. Yeah. And then I moved back in 82, and I go, holy mackerel. And now I will say that there is absolutely no food, ethnic food, contemporary food, any prepared food in restaurants, no food that's available in this country that you can't find in Dallas. So you're saying Dallas is very grown cosmopolitan. Up a little bit. Yeah. Very yeah. cosmopolitan yeah. on the food scene. There are actually more res restaurants in Dallas per capita than any other place in the country. Did you know that? Yeah. Happiest time in your life? Probably when my my son was born. He was my fifth pregnancy. My daughter was my ninth pregnancy. And they weren't easy. And having him and finally, you know, succeeded was wonderful. But he was the first. I did not expect to try to get pregnant again. And circumstances with a friend losing a child, um, you know, I kind of wanted another one. But my husband hadn't really dealt with the loss you know, of the, um, of the other children. And he said to me one day, if you want to try, I'm willing to do it. And I remember my mind going blank. And the only, my mind tends to go to music. Cause, and all I remember hearing was singing was, oh, happy days. And I go, oh God, I can't believe I'm doing this to myself. And I said, Okay, but there are three people I want to see before we attempt this. I want to see the, the gynecologist obstetrician to find out what are they going to do differently because I didn't want, as I said at the time, a crapshoot. You know, well, let's just try another time. And uh, I was going to see my internist to make sure I was healthy. And I said, I'm not going to find a therapist to take me through this because there's no way I'm going through this calmly. And I was in the house for six months, too, with her. You know, and... When they told me, they, they said, okay, we took a chance and had the amniocentesis because I was 39 and everything was fine. I didn't miscarry. And uh, they called me up. They said, you know, Tina, everything is fine. And I started to cry and I was so happy. And they said, do you want to know what you're having? I said, no. She said, you sure you don't want to know what you're having? I go, okay, tell me. They said, you're having a little girl. And my first reaction was, I can't have a little girl. I don't know how to do her hair. Now, you have to understand that, obviously, that wasn't the issue, you know. But I was so overwhelmed because I had not had girls before. The ones I had lost were boys. And she was just a joy. She, she kept me young. She, uh, she kept me on my toes. I mean, she taught, she taught me... What it, well, I taught her to stand up for herself and to say what it was on her mind rather than to try to please everybody, which was my big negative, I think, or positive if you were the recipient of my kindness. 
And she taught me to be strong, and she taught me to be the, really the whole person I am now, and she's wonderful. And um, recently she needed some oral surgery, and I had the opportunity to go and take care of her for five days. And I cried. We both cried at the end when I was leaving, and I said, I have to tell you, I love being a mommy, and I thank you for the opportunity to do it again. And she's 26. <laughs> um, getting my master's degree was wonderful. Um, and having my father tell me he was very proud of me. I was the first member of the family to get an advanced degree. Um, I tend to look at the positive things in life. In your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. You touched on the Kennedy assassinations. You also lived through the time of Martin Luther King assassination. Yes. Something good, the moon landing in 69, of course, mm -hmm. the tragedy of 9-11. Was there something else that really, on the national scene, that stood out that really affected you? One of the most momentous occasions for me was the election of Barack Obama the first time, and I went to his inauguration. And when I said I was going, most people said, what are you, crazy? What are you going there? It's going to be cold, da 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 And as it got closer, everybody said, oh, I'm so jealous. I wish I was going. And I said, I'm going because I grew up in a community that was half African American. And I saw, I remember, I remember very early when I was young, do, seeing a, a white only water fountain. And, you know, that changed rapidly because it was Nassau County. But I remember seeing people striving to do well and people being stereotyped. And I thought this, I mean, I think that everybody has, makes their mistakes. Uh, you know, I don't think he walks on water. But I was so proud to see somebody who had really educated themselves, picked themselves up, cared about the community. You know, one, not knowing how things were going to, you know, work out. But I was so proud, and I was so proud to be an American. And uh, the streets were filled with people of all stripes, just so happy. I was elated, and I was there alone. My daughter was in college there, but she had classes, and I'm walking around the street. I mean, we went to the inauguration together, and I can't tell you, that was unbelievable. Yeah. What advice do you want to leave for the next generation? There's a quote from the Ben-Gurion that I used, I used in my talks, and this applies to everything, it doesn't, it said, you're not to live in the past, but you should remember it for the future. And whether it's Jewish cultural, your connections, you know, we're moving away, you know, um, from some time, from, well, we're not, um, centered families anymore. I mean, I am here in Dallas, Texas. I have one son in Brooklyn and another daughter in Los Angeles. Um, but you, you need to know where you came from to know where you're going. And I think that has to do with, with everything in life. When I finished my talks and I said, if you're lucky enough to still have your mother alive, of course this is related to food, you need to get those recipes. And I know that people got choked up because their mothers weren't there. I said, and if you are a grandmother or a mother, you owe it to the next generation. It's what we teach our next generation that really will build the people that we want to see keep this country as great as it is. And I will tell you, um, I'm on a camp board in Northern California, the you have reformed Jewish camp. It's like Green Family, but it's my daughter went to that one. And my husband will tear up, and I'll tear up a lot of times when we see these kids sing or we, we pray with them on Shabbat when we go up there, because that's what makes a Jew for the future, regardless of how they affiliate regardless of how strongly they, you know, they, 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 they keep all of the laws or, you know, the holidays. But when you can really know who you are 
and really be brought up with the, the ethics that you want your children to have, then it carries on. And that's the big, biggest legacy. And I dedicated my second book to my kids because they are walking tenets of Judaism and ethics. Good job. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Thank you.